folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're talking about aliens, devils, because that's who they are. I want to continue with where we started last week. If you have not seen last week's program, I encourage you. you can, I mean, you can watch the rest of this, but then you'll have to go back and watch part one, which we did last week, because I have a lot of information I want to get through today in this particular broadcast. So I want to get right into it without a lot of talk and going back over what we examined last week. I want to start out with um, a quotation from a book. You see it there on the screen. Uh, the book is called Abduction, uh, Human Encounters with Aliens. This was written by Harvard, excuse me, Harvard Professor John Mack. Now, the reason why I start out with this um, is because, I mean, you just don't get to be a Harvard professor. You don't just walk up in your, you know, your boots and your overalls and say, hey, can I be one of them there Harvard psychiatrists? You just, okay, you, ha you have to be, I mean, he wrote several books, several of them won a Pulitzer Prize for one of them, which means that as a psychiatrist, and he's writing books on human psychiatry, which is, I mean, he's not gonna write on how to rebuild a transmission, even though there's like 20, what, 20,000 parts in a transmission, maybe it's a little less than that. The br human brain's a little bit more intricate than that. And with him writing all these books, with them being read and peer-reviewed by thousands of people all over the world, including members of his own profession, who read the book and say, his books and say, you know, he's right. He's right, and I'm gonna use that in my practice. So that's what elevates a man to the level of Harvard psychiatrist. So, you know, my point is, this is not, uh, you know, I chose this. There's a lot of books I have on UFOs and alien abductions. One uh, in particular, which is what got John Mack involved in it, written by Bud Hopkins, who was an artist. It was a sculptor. And he did regressions. He did, you know, hypnosis on people, and they talked about their alien abductions. Okay, well, that's, I, I don't doubt what he said, but... When you take someone who is the top person when he was alive in his field, who is a, someone who is trained in dealing with human psyche, human emotions, and all aspects of what human beings go through, normal human beings and abnormal, those with mental illnesses. When you take someone like that who got in, you know, introduced to Bud Hopkins at some point, learned of his work, probably read his research. For some reason, this grabbed John Mack's attention. And he decided to look into it. And so then he begins his own clinical type research. He's examining them like a doctor would examine a patient. So he examines these people, does hypnosis, does regression on them, and all of a sudden now they're telling his story, or their story. They're telling him their story. And again, when he wrote this book, he got into a lot of trouble at Harvard. I mean, he realized probably early on, he was probably told, because, you know, you don't do this in secret, he, he was probably told at some point by some of his peers at Harvard, you know, they're not going to like this. If you come out with a book on that, they're not, they're going to like it. And they didn't. They formed a committee, and they were going to throw him out. And they decided that they didn't really have grounds to do it. He was a professor there. He was tenured and so there's they don't have any compelling reason to throw him out and you know I used the quote last week you can talk about gods and devils and or God and devils and angels at Harvard because it was a school of theology you just can't talk about aliens but we know from the Bible the, the connection is there 
between aliens and angels or devils. So, um, as a way of introduction, here is a quote from the beginning of John Mack's book on alien abductions. Here's, and he, he's introducing the various types of some of the alien races that we're examining in this series. He says, as an introduction, inside the ships, the abductees usually witness more alien beings who are busy doing various tasks related to monitoring the equipment and handling the abduction procedures. The beings described by my cases are of several sorts. They appear as tall or short luminous entities that may be translucent or at least not altogether solid. Reptilian creatures have been seen that seem to be carrying out mechanical functions. Nordic-looking, blonde, human-like beings are seen and human helpers are sometimes observed working alongside the humanoid alien beings. But by far the most common entity observed are the small greys, humanoid beings three to four feet in height. The greys are mainly of two kinds, smaller drone or insect-like workers who move or glide robotically outside and inside the ships and perform various specific tasks, and a slightly taller leader or doctor, as the abductees most often call him. That is, again, from the book Abduction on page 22. So um, this coincides with the information that Richard Doty, and I featured him in a Pastor Mike online uh, several weeks ago. You can go back and watch that, where Richard Doty, because he was working in above top secret classified projects, he was read in on the United States government's knowledge of some of these alien races. And Richard Doty mentioned the Ebens, which are the, what we call the greys. He mentioned the reptile, he mentioned the insect type creatures. He mentioned the ones that look like humans that you would not be able to tell. They were not human until you got up really close. Then you started looking at them, then you could tell that they didn't look like, you know, there were certain, he didn't really get into detail, but there were certain things that when you got close, you could say, I've never seen that in a human. And so that's what John Mack, he has all of these people come lay on his couch. and he, Now, I can't tell you that I know for a fact that the, all of these people went up into a spaceship. I can't tell you that. We know that devils have the power, especially those who are lost. We, ha, we know we have the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We, that's Ephesians 2.2. 2. We know that devils have the ability in lost people to plant ideas into their head. Hypnosis is not some miracle, it's not used in court. Hypnosis is not some miracle thing that actually peels away the layers of the onion of the mind to get to the core and that everybody under hypnosis is always telling the truth. It doesn't always work that way. And I personally am not a fan of hypnosis. I'm not saying if you've ever had it done, you're full of devils and on and on. I'm just not a big fan of it. But the ideas that these people were conveying to John Mack were ideas that were firmly planted inside of their mind, whether they ex actually experienced it and then the aliens sort of gave them sort of a, you know, here, we're like men in black, stare at this, poof, and all of a sudden it wipes their memory. And it really happened that way. It was a historical event for these people and it actually happened that way or it's something that was put into their minds by devils. I don't know one or the other. I don't know that. What I know is that the ideas that were in these people's minds about the different types of alien races is exactly what we're examining from the scriptures. I read last week, we ended last week with one of his cases, a lady by the name of Sarah, I'm going to go back and remind you of what she reported, what was in her head about these particular reptilian creatures. Sarah, like all abductees, perhaps may be participating in some sort of project of species merger and evolution. 
The purpose of this project may be to create new life forms that are more spiritually evolved and less aggressive, while retaining the acute sensory possibilities that accompany the dense embodiment of human physical existence. One part of our long hypnosis session involves Sarah's memories of an encounter with an alien being that she experienced as occurring partly in our physical reality and partly in another, non-physical dimension. I asked Sarah to say more about the being she saw in the hotel room. The head was the most prominent part of the body and was shimmery looking reptilian, almost snake-like, serpent-like, and quite elongated. Red vein things made the head appear like a body turned inside out. I think I've seen that movie. The creature was not bad. It's nice enough. It was almost like a sea creature, like a mollusk or a snail without the shell. It seemed vulnerable, in need of understanding and cooperation from her. So in this one quote, she mentions reptilian, snake-like, serpent-like, body turned inside out. I, I mean, I think I've seen this movie. I, I can't remember it, but I think I've seen it before. Okay, which brought us then to, you know, we talked last week about the serpent, 2 Corinthians 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little my folly and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now let me stop right here. The idea that we, we, as the body of Jesus Christ, have been espoused to Christ, Christ is the husband, we are the wife. To me, the idea that is behind what we just read here, the idea of what's behind this alien intervention in mankind is the aliens want to be the husband and mankind's going to be the wife. Remember, Satan says, I will be like the most high. God's son has a bride. Satan's son needs a bride or his sons need a bride, just like in Genesis chapter 6, all right? So that's, to me, those two ideas merge together. Those two ideas, I think, are related. Uh, verse 3, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So what we have here, I believe, here's the plan. You have God and his son Jesus Christ, who is the bridegroom, we are the bride. That's going to happen. Nothing's, nothing's going to stop it. Nothing is. The devil's trying to intervene in that to stop it, but it's not it's not going to happen. It's not, nothing's going to stop Jesus from marrying his bride. That's the translation. That's the rapture. So the devil says, I will be like the most high. So you have, again, whether you choose to call them, refer to them as aliens, and they are in every sense of the word. They're not from here. So the word alien in its strict sense applies. Or spirit beings devils, evil angels, fallen angels if you want, whatever. The idea is their merger with humanity to create a hybrid of some sort. That to me is very clear. That to me, that idea, and it's a corruption of Adam and Eve or God's son and God's son's bride coming together. To me, that is the corruption of it. Um, here's something else John Mack writes in his book, Abductions. Types of experience during abductions that appear to be related to personal growth and transformation are as follows. Now, stop right here. Are as follows. Stop right here. Transformation is a word, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You hang on to that, because that's salvation. You see, when you're saved, you start thinking differently. 
you think Bible. You start, you know, before you hated preachers, hated church, hated the gospel. No, I, I want to keep my alcohol and my drugs and my cigarettes. I want to keep chasing women, have my sack of playboys. I, I want to keep all of that. But then you get saved and you go, I don't want that anymore. And God starts slowly but surely delivering you from those things that had its clutches on you in your life. And you start thinking you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what's taking place and what has to take place in this world, there has to be a transformation of the consciousness of humanity. There has to be a change in how they think. And that's coming. It is referred to in 2 Thessalonians as strong delusion. But the idea of what he said here, types of experience during abductions that appear to be related to personal growth and transformation, a change in consciousness. So that's another gospel, a different gospel that transforms people in a different way than salvation transforms people. Make sense? He says, the aliens may be perceived as intermediaries. Stop right here. Intermediaries. The mediary part means mediator. There is one mediator between God and men, the man, not the reptilian, not the gray, not the Nordic. There is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. See? The aliens may be perceived as intermediaries or intermediate entities between the fully embodied state of human beings and the primal source of creation or quote unquote God in the sense of a cosmic consciousness rather than a personified being. In this regard, abductees sometimes liken the alien beings to angels or other light beings, including the grace. See, I told you they were devils. I told you. John Mack and I agree. Even though he wasn't a born-again Christian, he probably had a Bible, because Harvard is or was a seminary, okay? And I'm sure he knows the basics of Christianity as he is informed on the basics of other religions across the world. I told you, they were devils. The abductees may actually experience themselves as returning to their cosmic source or home. This is where it gets dangerous an inexpressibly beautiful realm beyond or not in space time as we know it. When this occurs during a hypnosis session, powerful, inexpressibly joyous, even orgiastic feeling occurs. Conversely, abductees may weep with sadness when they experience having to leave their cosmic home, return to earth and become embodied once again. It's a setup. It's a setup. The aliens, the devils, show these people the eight where the aliens live. And it was such a glorious place. Do you get what he's saying here? They showed they gave them some false heaven thing. This is where humanity originally started. We seated you on this planet and we're checking on you. Now, do you want to go with us to our new world? You get that? Stop and think for just a second. The new world order the aliens show these people their home planet, where humans actually came from, they say. So could it not be that the goal of a new world order is to make this world like the heaven world? 
that the aliens showed these people. Bum, bum, ba. But these abductees, John Mack is regressing these people through hypnosis and they're describing this quote unquote false heaven and he said tears flow down their eyes. They start crying because they have to return back to this miserable earth. And something I read, I don't have here in my notes, but something I read where Max said that all of these abductees, they often come back now with an attitude that we're harming the earth, they are more in tune with nature, they're more uh, in love with the planet, and we need to save the planet at all cost. We need to make this place a better world. We're in, after all, we're all the same. We're all in harmony one with another. Let's get rid of all the national borders. Let's get rid of all the weapons of war. Let's get rid of all the evil politicians. Let's, get, let's, let's just have heaven on earth. They all turn into environmentalists, basically is what he said. Every one of them. They all turn into tree huggers. Every single one of them. And you understand, I love this world that God has put me to live on. And I am not interested in destroying the beauty of God's creation. I'll let God do that. But you also understand that we have a far better place that God has prepared for us to live in. So as far as me loving this world, I'm only here temporarily, so I'm not getting attached to it. It's beautiful. I love, I, like I say, it's providing me everything that I need to live a comfortable life in this world right now. Well, not everything I need, but you understand what I'm saying. I'm here in this world and it's okay for now. But if God pulls me away and says, let's go, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm done. I don't want any. The cancer thing with my wife has really, I mean, God used that to really, Mike, wake up. This world is bad and it's going to get worse and don't get stuck to it. So that's where I'm at with this. But the abductees, they come back and they're going, oh, this planet, we need to save our mother. I'm going to introduce to you a man who, whom John Mack, he's obviously using pseudonyms for these abductees, Sarah and Paul. And they may be, um, Paul and Sarah both may be like, you know, movies when they, when they are making a movie about something that happened in history. One actor and his character may be like a combination of six people who in actual history were there but the movie shortens them down into one person. You see what I'm saying? So Paul and Sarah may be that, but I'm going to introduce you to Paul in John Mack's book, Abductions. Here's what he says about the reptilians. Paul, another contactee, he says, this reptilian form was very intelligent. They can tell time. They can feel time. They understand what's coming in the future. No, they don't. That's a setup. That is a set up. These aliens have, and, it, and we're not just dealing with the people that John Mack interviewed. We're dealing with across the board in the entire UFO alien agenda. These, these people trust the, what the aliens are telling them about human history and the human future. They trust that. They say these aliens, they can see time differently than we do. They see into the future. They see into the past. They've got these devices that can show us what happened in the past. And there was, I've heard internet rumors and, the, you know, whatever, that there was some sort of hologram book that you looked at and it could show you uh, like a video or film of Christ's crucifixion. I don't believe that. There may be something like that, showing people what these devils want people to see. But it's not the word, it's not this book. This is the sure word of prophecy, people. Not what the alien said, not what Rasputin said, not what, um, 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 can't remember the guy's name. A couple hundred years ago, made all these 
prophecies. You know who I'm talking starts with an N or something like that. Okay? It's not that, and it's, it's not anything to do with that. This book is the only sure word of prophecy. Period. We're only to believe what's in this. Even everybody made a big deal about St. Malachi, and they counted the popes. St. Malachi made a, a prophecy concerning the popes, and this pope is the last pope, and he's the Antichrist. And the, people made a big deal about that. I don't trust that. St. Malachi who? He's not in the Bible anywhere. I don't trust that stuff, people. I don't. I read this book, and I believe what this book says concerning what's going to happen in the future. This stuff here is a setup. It's a setup. So these aliens are convincing everybody they can see into the future and they're here to protect or alter the future, the outcome of the future or whatever. We're trying to intervene. We need your help. You need ours. And they don't recognize this is a setup getting people down to the Valley of Armageddon. Anyway, he says his own role, Paul said, was to function as a bridge between the aliens and the human world. That's a mediator. They want me to form a group that can meet with them. They need us to, to not be so afraid of them, to be open, to understand, to enter into an exchange of love. I told you last week that I was going to tell you about the woman who had the dragon baby. We're getting there. We're getting there. So, let's let the sure word of prophecy tell us who these, that's interesting, dragons really are. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She being with child cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now, you understand, here's the, here's the real truth behind this. These dragon, reptilian devils, these aliens, are trying to convince people there's something coming, there's a bad thing coming, we need your help, you're going to need our help, let's all join together so we can fight off this. That was in the movie Arrival, you remember? There's something coming that we need humans' help, you need our help, so let's merge together so we can fight off this common enemy. And that is exactly what the reptilians and the, the devils are telling people. The dragon knows that the birth of this child is his downfall. You have pictures of it. Remember when they tried to kill Joseph at a young age? 17, still child. And Okay, and that's how old Joseph was. They tried to kill him at a young age. Then Moses born, they tried to kill Moses. Only the devils don't know which one of the Jews is going to be the Savior. So they say, we're going to kill all the baby, the Jewish babies born. Herod, same thing. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Go show me where he is so that I may worship him. You don't want to worship him, Herod. You want to kill him. So he ends up slaughtering all the children two years old and younger who are Jewish children thinking, if I slaughter them all, I'll be sure to get the one that's going to be the Savior, the King of the Jews. Well, he, he missed the one. It's the same way here. The dragon is ready to devour this child as soon as it, and this child is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. The devil knows it, doesn't want it to happen. So then he gets cast, him and his angels get cast down to the earth. And so now let's go make a war with the remnant of her seed, DNA. Mm -mm -mm. So that's, that's who these reptilians are. The Bible's, and the whole point of Revelation 12 
in this context is to identify from Scripture these reptilian aliens. They are dragons. That in every sense of the word, they're dragons because God created them that way. Now, they are fourth dimension angelic dragons, but they are dragons nonetheless. They are, at, if you understand the Bible correctly, the book of Hebrews tells you that this world is not the real. It's the shadow to the real world, which is the spiritual realm. And we sing, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. This land is just a shadow of the heavenly realm. And what does that tell you? I mean, my shadow's real, but the one casting the shadow is more real than the shadow is. And that's the spiritual realm. So that's where these dragons really are and who they really are. They are devils. And like John Mack said, when they see them, when these people see them, this almost angel-like. That's because that's who they are. Revelation 12, 7, so there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that, to me, then, is going to be the alien invasion. That's what I think is going to happen. So for right now, the, the alien slash devils are telling all these abductees, we're sending you back to the earth to go tell your story. Think about it. If none, if nobody on earth ever recalled having any of these abduction scenarios, or if there was just one, like Betty and Barney Hill. Betty and Barney Hill that we know of was really the first big abduction story that made headlines, came across human consciousness all over the world. So if there was only one couple who had ever experienced this, then you could say, hmm, isn't it odd that these two people married each other and then they both end up having the same psychosis because no one else has ever had this happen. But we know now from different polls that have been done that there are in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who say, you know what, I think I was abducted by aliens. And they're not, they're not joking about it. So what we have happening here, we have the setup. We have the setup. The devils, it's like John the Baptist coming before Jesus. He's announcing his coming. With all of these abductions, see these people who have been abducted as a type of John the Baptist who is, war who is telling mankind, you need to change your consciousness. And, and follow the progression now of the whole alien scenario. 1947, before Roswell in 1947, no one, really no one, thinks that there's going to be aliens from other planets come visit the Earth. But Kenneth Arnold in 1947, seeing these flying saucers, that making headlines all over the world, and then the United States Army releasing a news the Army sent a guy over to a radio station with an Army typed up news statement that was, they said, you've got to read this over the airwaves. The Army Air Force Base at Roswell has captured a crashed flying saucer. That was the news article that came out. Then somebody higher up got involved and said, we're covering this up. That never happened. So the progression is from Roswell to today, before Roswell and Kenneth Arnold, no one, no one, believing aliens, UFOs, aliens, that they're life on other planets, because it's, this is a Christian nation, technically. 
after Roswell, it ramps up to today's world where now, post-World War II, post-Vietnam, the Bible is not the centerpiece of American thought. Something else has replaced it. The Bible was taken out as being the centerpiece of American thought, so now there's a void there and it's being filled with all kinds of religious ideas. And I've tried to focus on those throughout the years that I've been doing this, the different ways the devil is approaching humanity with the same idea. I'm going to take over. So whether it's secret societies or false religions or the alien, the, and I'm not just turning over to the alien agenda. This is part of all of the years of ministry that I've spent telling, warning people about the different ways that the devil uses to bring people to the same conclusion. We're going to fight Jesus. And he's using whatever means he can. Meanwhile, this old Bible's stayed the same. All of those, through all of those times, through all those different cults, all these different ideologies, the Bible's remained the same, telling us exactly what is going to happen. And at some point, these angels are going to get cast out of heaven. They're going to fall to the earth. And that's your fourth kingdom. At that point, and now remember this, the angels being cast out into the earth, because we're going to see it in the context of what the Bible tells us about these dragons. So, this dragon is Satan that old devil, the serpent, the serpent from Genesis 3, the devil from all through the Bible, Satan from all through the Bible, that's who he is. In Ezekiel 28, 20, 38, Ezekiel 38 then tells us that this dragon is a cherub, and cherubs are what was described in Ezekiel 1. Eze let's go to Ezekiel 28. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So, Satan is a cherub. Cherubs, the, the description that we have of cherubs comes from Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, Revelation 4. Yeah, Revelation 4. And here's how they're described in Revelation, or excuse me, Ezekiel 10. I'll, I'll get there. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub. The appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. The point I'm making is this, that these cherubs, reptilian cherubs, cherubs are accompanied with chariots or associated with chariots because of the wheels that we see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. So it's no marvel then that these chariots, these flying saucers, wheels, chariots are accompanied and ridden by draconian reptilian entities. I think that's the connection that the Bible is, is making here. Um, how many movies and TV shows and those of you who grew up in the 70s, you remember the Slee Stacks? I was, there wasn't anything on on Saturday morning that I didn't watch. I watched, we had three channels from the three major networks, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And I watched everything I could from all three channels on Saturday morning. But my favorite was from the land of the lost. Remember that? Marshall, Will, and Holly, and they enter a, in a time portal, and they get thrown into some place where there's dinosaurs and pakus, 
and slee stacks. Remember the slee stacks? One of them was named Enoch. Dun, dun, dun. And slee stacks were reptilian, alien type things. So many movies, uh, and I featured three of them here other than Land of the Lost. Remember the movie Enemy Mine with Lewis Gossett Jr.? I mean, he played a good part there, but he was a draconian. He was a draconian, and um, the lead character, I can't remember his name, actually took care of his baby because the reptilian male gave birth. Okay? Then you have uh, the last starfighter and the aliens there, the good, the good aliens, the good aliens. And in enemy mind, in enemy mind, the humans are fighting a war against the reptilians, the draconians. But then one human finds out that the draconians are actually good, the good guys. The reptilians are the, are the good guys. They're not the bad guys. They're the good guys. Last Starfighter, the same thing. Now, in V, which was an 80s miniseries based upon an 80s movie, followed up by a 2000s ABC TV show miniseries. Didn't last too long. They tried to revamp the series like Battlestar Galactica, and Battlestar Galactica did well, but when they revamped V, it didn't do so well. But it's still the same idea. These human-like aliens come down, but when you peel off their skin, they're all reptilians. But they come down all at once, all over the world, paradigm shift everybody on the planet, and they're lining everybody up saying, we're going to cure all your diseases but we want something, okay? So there's a little truth there. So the idea of reptilian aliens is not, if, if this is all brand new to you, where have you been for the last 30 years, okay? Because there's been a push now to convince everybody through subtle means, this is real, this is happening and it's gonna continue to happen. So. We go to Isaiah 13, and Isaiah 13 is going to tell us that there is going to be, that there is going to be an invasion of dragons. Isaiah 13, verse 19, In Babylon the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, or Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs which are half human, half beast, think about that, shall dance there. Wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces and her time is near to come and her day shall not be prolonged. This is written in the past, not as something that's already happened, but it's written as something that is going to happen. Going to happen. It is, this is going to happen. Dragons are coming to invade this planet and they're going to set up house. They're going to come in and move in people's palaces. Palaces usually reserved for kings. What does that tell you? Buckingham. Now, if you believe David Icke, I don't. David Icke says that the Queen of England already is a shape-shifting reptilian. Icke, you should have stuck with football. 
British football. He should have stuck with that. Because he already believes that Bucking, everybody lives in Buckingham Palace is already shape-shifting reptilians. And David Icke basically is a new ager. He does new, he's like Steve, he's like the Stephen Greer of the United States. He's the Stephen Greer of Great Britain. And he's leading every, all of his followers into new age practices. That's the only way we're going to conquer these reptilians. But I'm telling you, the dragons are going to invade this planet. And according to John Mack again, that dragon invasion is going to accompany a change in consciousness. Look at what he says. Abduction experiencers report that the aliens themselves, when confronted with this issue, say that we are not ready to acknowledge their existence and would treat them aggressively as an enemy as we do anyone or anything different from ourselves that we do not understand. But most importantly, the aliens say their methods are different. Some abductees report that the aliens do not wish to bring about change through coercion, but rather through a change of consciousness that would lead to our choosing a different course. Some abductees receive information of battles for the fate of the earth and the control of human mind between two or more groups of beings, some of which are more evolved or good, while others are less evolved or evil. Now, guess what? I'm one of those who are going to be less evolved. I'm going to be one of them because I, number one, evolution is a farce. Evolution is not how we ended up on this planet. We were put here by God, created by God out of dirt and God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Now we have a living soul living in us. We didn't evolve from lower species and we're not evolving to a higher species, or at least I'm not. Evolution is, has nothing, the whole idea of evolution has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with how life showed up on this earth. The whole point of evolution is to convince everybody that every species on the planet came from a lesser species and evolved to a greater species and we're going to change everything in the world and every species, we're going to do it ourselves this time. We're going to evolve to a higher species. And at least this part, the dragons are telling mankind there's going to be a war. And it's going to be a war between the higher good evolved species with the lesser evolved species, meaning species, meaning us Christians. However, when this war takes place, and it's going to be the Battle of Armageddon, we won't have these bodies weighing us down anymore. We will have been transformed and will come back riding on white horses with Jesus who comes with ten thousands of his saints. Looking forward to that. Now, Isaiah 13, the invasion of the dragons, is actually prophetically linked to something that's mentioned also in Isaiah 13. Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts muster at the host of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation destroy the whole land. In verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And then in verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. So, when this war occurs, 
and this invasion of dragon, uh, dragons or reptilians occurs, God is going to shake the heavens like a snow globe, right? What's going to happen when he shakes the heavens? We get that from Revelation 6. Verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Haggai chapter 2 verse 20, And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the, th the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and the riders shall come down, and every one by the sword of his brother. Do you see that? When the shaking of the heavens occurs, Revelation 6 says that's when the stars are going to fall. That's when the dragon's going to take one-third of the stars and cast them to the earth. And he says in Haggai that when he shakes the heavens and the earth, he's going to overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. That's the aliens. He's going to... Of course, God is going to send them to this earth. And when he sends them to this earth, it's going to be for a reason. It's so that Jesus and his ten thousands of his saints can come down. And we're, going to, we're just going to fight everybody all at once. They're going to come down, merge with humankind. Now, when Jesus comes, we're just going to, we're going to fight them, get rid of them all at once. God, that's a pretty good plan. Count me in. Amen? These reptilians are little g gods slash devils slash evil angels slash aliens. You can use any of those terms because they all apply. So we go back to that verse in Psalm 82. Jesus quoted it, but it's Psalm 82. I've said, you're all gods and all of ye children of the Most High, yet ye shall die like men. So that's already happened a time or two. It's going to happen in mass at the Battle of Armageddon. And these gods, well... People have been worshiping gods for years. And there was a news article. Um, I think my buddy Smitty from India sent it to me. This is what happened in South America. The proven city of Chicleo, also known as the capital of friendship, has a really weird monument dedicated to the ancient god Morop, the reptilian. In Peru's fourth largest city, a statue stands tall. The work of art is meant to show the deity Morop and was, being, and was built taking into account ancient descriptions of the reptilian god some 2,000 years ago. Isn't that interesting? 2,000 years ago. The area of northern Peru was inhabited by the Mocha people, a civilization with a rich culture and mythology that continues to baffle us to this day. Case in point, the statue of the decidedly reptilian god Morop, the Iguana Man. The Mochicas regarded the Iguana Man as a powerful character who was crucial to their descent into the underworld, acting as a mediator between the world of the living and the dead. Morop was equally feared and revered. It's exactly what John Mack said, that these aliens were mediators between humans and quote-unquote God, who is not a one living entity, but sort of a universal consciousness. That's... Yeah, whatever. 
So these reptilian, we're not making this up. Whoever lived, whatever tribe it was that lived in Peru 2,000 years ago, they obviously saw their God manifest. A reptilian humanoid that came down from the heavens that was the mediator between them, yeah, whatever. Now, one thing I know about the UFO community is that they, they say that the aliens, the reptilians, claim that they're the ones who seeded the earth. They're the ones, they're the reason why we're here. The humans were not created according to the biblical account, the, the way God created Adam. That didn't happen. It was actually the aliens who came down and this is what Eric Von Daniken suggested, starting with Chariots of the Gods and all the books that followed. He believes in what Francis Crick believed in, the idea of panspermia. That now, Francis Crick believed that there was a comet that had DNA on it and it crashed into the earth and the DNA started doing what DNA does. It started forming living organisms. So, because Fran Francis Crick said, there is, I know how complex DNA is. There is no way in the world that it just showed up all at once accidentally. So he believed that DNA f was floating around in the heavens on a comet and it crashed into the earth and that's how we all ended up here. The UFO community believes that the aliens seeded us deliberately onto this earth and that idea is ingrained into a lot of them. And you find that idea in the various myths, like for instance, the first emperor of China, Huang Di, he is believed to be the child of a human woman and a dragon believed by the Chinese to be a demigod that not only ruled over early China, but also who created the Han people of China. And the Han people of China still exist to this day. In other words, the Hans, the Hans believed that they were seated here by a dragon. They believe they are the children of the dragon. There is a Chinese myth of the creation of humans on the planet, and that is the myth of Fu Shi and Nu Hua, who are spirit dragons, who are believed to be the ones who seeded humans on the earth. And here's their representation. Notice what it looks like. It looks like DNA. And Fu Shi and Nu Hua are seen holding the square and compass. We know what that means, right? The square and compass represents the sons of God and the daughters of men. In other words, that the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. No new thing under the sun. And that brings in what if you, if you hear anything about UFOs and aliens, you're bound to hear Zechariah Sitchin's theories about ancient Sumeria because that has become ingrained. If you've ever watched an episode of Ancient Aliens, then you've watched every episode of Alien A Ancient Aliens because every episode of Ancient Aliens, it's like watching a soap opera. It's the same story over and over and over again, just different players. So if you've ever watched one episode of Ancient Aliens, you'll hear the ancient alien theory of the Anunnaki the Sumerians account of how humans ended up on the planet. The Anunnaki are an alleged race of reptilian humanoids who were the gods of the Sumerians slash Babylonians. Their name derives from their parentage. An is the Sumerian word for heaven. Ki is the word for earth. Thus, heaven and earth combined. According to author Zachariah Sitchin, and others, the Anunnaki, are 
ancient aliens who created the human race to be a slave race, used to dig gold out of the earth to be transported back to their home planet. Now, here's what's interesting to me. On is heaven, key is earth, and that takes us, I believe, to who the, there actually was a race of people on the earth who were the children of heaven and earth. Genesis 6, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, part of that is true. Now, humans themselves were not seeded here by the aliens, but there was a race of people who lived on this earth who were the offspring of the gods, sons of God, aliens, angels, evil angels, ye are gods and all of ye children of the Most High, referring to angels who are immortal beings who came down and mated with human women and created the giants. It happened before the flood, and it happened after the flood. And I just did a series called Giants for those who don't believe, and I laid out the biblical case. I'm not going to do that today, but I laid out the biblical case for why I believe what I believe. I didn't get it from the Book of Enoch. I didn't get it from Zechariah Sitchin. I got it from the Word of God. Now, here's my thinking. I'm wondering if the phrase Anunnaki, which is a derivative of Enki, in meaning heaven, key meaning earth, I'm wondering if that is connected to the giant Anak in the Bible. Numbers 13, 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Deuteronomy 2, verse 10. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, and a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, Anak, which were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So I'm just, uh, to me, when I hear the term Anunnaki and Enki, I immediately think maybe the, the term in the Bible is Anak. Anak himself was born of Arba, and Arba was a giant and probably the first generation of giants. Actually, Arba's father was a son of the gods or a son of God, an angel. Okay? So that's kind of, I'm kind of putting those two terms, I'm looking at Anak and Enki or the Anunnaki, and I think there's a connection there. Could be wrong, but I think there is. So now, I've been promising you, I told you last week in the first part of this series about showing you a woman who claims that she has had, now, now before I say this, let me back up. John Mack said that many, John Mack and others who have written books about alien abductions, multiple um, stories about women who said that eggs were taken from them or an alien mated with them and impregnated them and then months later took the fetus out. You have a lot of stories of that where you have 
alien abductees who were women who were saying they were pregnant and then several months later they were not pregnant. So the lady that I'm going to show you is not the only one who gives that story. There was a lot of them who told the same story. But her name is Nancy Tremaine. Now, there are several videos on YouTube. You, you should be able to find them. You type in the name Nancy Tremaine. Uh, this particular video, I um, took a little sound bites from. She's giving a speech at Ozark Mountain UFO Conference, which I think is in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I may go to that one time. But she's talking and she's talking about her alien abduction that started back in the 19, late 1950s. And she talks about these, all these different reptilian aliens that she saw. Nancy Tremaine claims that since she was 12 years old, she had been abducted by telepathic draconian aliens, led by a humanoid draconian that demanded to be called Mr., which is short for Master. Stop right here. No man can serve two masters. This woman, and the way that she describes, and you, I don't, I don't really recommend to a lot of people that they go and watch these people talk and, and do the research that I've done. Not everybody can handle some of the information that these people tell because I don't want someone who might be weak in faith to hear some of the lies that are being told because they don't have enough shield of faith to be able to deflect these fiery darts. And I can tell you, there's been things that I've investigated, that I've read, that I've watched, I will listen to people talk, that's made me go, hmm, no, 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 it's the Word of God, it's the Bible, okay? I was able to deflect the fiery dart with my shield of faith, not Captain America's shield, it's, this is better. I believe every Word of God is true, and I don't believe the, the, some of the lies that these reptilians want these people to tell, okay? So, but she serves her master well. She does. She is not a born-again Christian. She serves her master well. As I attempt to serve my master well, I would like for my master to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want. Anyway, these, this humanoid draconian dragon demanded to be called Mr. She reports that Mr. impregnated her, then removed the fetus after only three months. The child was taken by the aliens and at one point Tremaine was allowed to go on board and nurse the child, whom she named Drax. Now, there is a picture here. The one on the right is a picture, supposedly, of she was allowed to nurse Drax, and he clawed her. That's what she said. And there, on the, the picture on the left is her and Drax, I believe. She describes her relationship with Mr. as, quote, symbiotic. She believes that her child, Drax, will be a wise judge on the earth one day. That's a setup. Because if she really did, and I believe it's possible, we know it's possible from the scriptures, if she really did have an alien baby, at some point there's going to be a hybrid. Revelation 13 tells us 
that the, the number of the beast is the number of a man. Now, listen to what I just said. The number of the beast is the number of a man. Beast and man together in the same entity. And that number is 603 score and 6. But the idea of symbiotic basically means that they need us and we need them. That's the concept behind the fourth kingdom, iron mixing with miry clay, but it doesn't mix too well. She said, my most spiritual experience was on board ship with Mr. in 2015, where I witnessed several angels, each representing a distinct group of beings. There was no division of race. I felt a love not found on this planet. They were all working together in harmony working for the good of this planet, to save this planet, and I was given this message. We are benevolent beings. We are here to help save the planet. If this makes us angels, then we are. Since humanity began keeping records, legends of the reptilians and their participation in the creation of man has continued. But as long, and listen to what she says, but as long as they remain a politically incorrect species, we will have no chance of unity. Politically incorrect, are you really, you're going to bring social justice into this, Nancy? Okay, it's like, you know, an interracial couple. That was not... That was frowned upon years ago. Nowadays, not so much. So she's bringing that into this. As long as they remain politically incorrect, that will never... I mean, that was her comment. Like, we, we really need to accept these aliens, these dragons, as our lovers so that we can save humanity. Remember... There's an agenda here behind this. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. And the whole thing is she was convinced by these, by Mr. Master, she was convinced that they're here to save humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In this case, Mr. didn't give his son. He took him back. Mm -mm -mm. Now, Isaiah 34. It's another place in the scripture that tells us about a dragon invasion. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons, which would be devils, aliens, evil spirits, unclean spirits, and so on, and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl shall rest there and find herself a place of rest. Now, this is in the context of another passage that links to the book of Revelation. Isaiah 34, 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. That is Another passage that points us to, so we have Isaiah 13 pointing us to Revelation 6, Isaiah 34 pointing us again to Revelation 6, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree. See, John is writing this, and it's matching Isaiah. As a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were removed out of their places. So, God is telling you when this invasion is going to take place, God's going to roll the heavens back as a scroll, and the heavens are going to be dissolved, and angels are going to fall 
God's going to shake heaven and angels are going to fall like figs when you shake a fig tree, when she's shaken of a mighty wind. What did they hear on the day of Pentecost? Mm -mm -mm. Jeremiah 9-11. Jeremiah 9-11. You know, I did a, a Watchman broadcast several years ago called um, something 9-11. But it was from Revelation 9-11. It was based upon that and how... 9-11 shows up, all these movies, all these different scenes, all these different things and so on. Then, of course, 9-11-2001. So we have in Revelation chapter 9, which is, happens to be this page, verse 11, and they had a king over them, which was the angel of the bottomless pit. So two things are going to happen. Angels are going to get kicked out of heaven, fall to the earth, Angels are going to belch up from the bowels of the earth to the surface of the earth. That's Revelation 9-11, Jeremiah 9-11. Dun, dun, dun. And I will make Jerusalem heaps and a den of dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant. Now look at verse 13. And the Lord saith, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and will give them water of gall to drink, and I will scatter them also among the heathen, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send a sword after them, till I have consumed them. Now he's mentioning wormwood, and that points us to, so we have the seal judgments, the bringing in of wormwood related to this brings in the trumpet judgments. Revelation 8, 10, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Bitter, wormwood, star falling. God said that he was going to bring a bitter nation to this world. Bitter nation. Wormwood Nation. So, the reptilians, the dragons, the serpents, UFOs, aliens, evil angels, unclean spirits, devils. What's, what's, their, what's the real agenda? What is it they're really trying to set up? on this earth. What's the goal here? Let's read it. Psalm 44, verse 19. Though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons and covered us with the shadow of death. And what's really interesting is Whitley Stryber. And I've, I've listened to several things that Stryber has said Streber. That's how he pronounces it. My apologies. Um, he's written several books. Before he wrote Communion, he was, a, he was already a novelist and had written two books that became films. One of them was Wolfen, which is sort of like a werewolf story. I remember seeing that movie back in the 80s and I'm going, I don't like it. There's not enough werewolf there. You know, I'm thinking Lon Chaney and stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, so he, but the, the thing is about Streber, when he wrote Communion, it really busted open. He's, he got m millions of letters from people all over the world saying, that's what happened to me. Oh my goodness. 
This is back in the 90s, before social media. So he's getting millions of letters from people all over the world saying that is exactly, when I saw that picture, it brought it all out. So he really broke open this whole idea of what a gray alien even is. And of course a movie was made about it, and the movie doesn't really match the book too well. But anyway, um, here's the thing about Strieber. Strieber is not just some innocent guy minding his own business. He's been involved in Eastern mysticism meditation for years. And then all of a sudden these aliens start showing up, taking him to their ship. Do you see the, uh, there, to me, the absolute connection. He involved, he made a choice to involve himself. He, he's an American, so therefore he knows that the church of Jesus Christ exists. You know it. And you're surrounded by churches. But he chooses to follow Eastern mysticism. And Eastern Hindu theology is full of serpent gods called the Nagas who fly in ships called Vimanas that look like flying saucers. Imagine that! And then all of a sudden, now because he's involved, because, because Strieber has injected his consciousness into the realm of these devils, now they've injected themselves into his life. And I've seen several talks by him. It's easier to listen to a guy speak for a few hours than it is to read a book. I have this time thing with me. And you sort of get an idea of who he is. And he is New Age occult to the core. There's nothing in him that resembles Bible Christianity is what I'm saying. So here's what he said. The message that Schreiber has consistently preached since it's his best-selling book, appeared is that these visitors consistently bring with them spirits of those who have died and that all, all myths about heaven and hell are untrue. That's, that's part of it. Got to have a paradigm shift. Got to change consciousness. We have to get everybody away from the, this Bible myth, quote unquote, and follow this new paradigm. The aliens really know the truth. They really do because they've been around for thousands of years, millions of years, millions of years. They've been around millions of years. They actually, they actually put us here on this planet, so they know the truth, right? And so they know that, you know, religion was just man's way of controlling man. Yeah, so now we'll let the aliens control us. That's better. Here, here it is in one sweep. Revelation 13. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. See all these reptilian gods from ages past. If you remember, uh, this year, one of the Watchmen broadcasts I did, I featured the discovery of humanoid, serpent humanoid mummies. I still have not, I still have not seen that these mummies have been proven to be a hoax. I still have not seen that. Is it even possible? Psalm 82 says it is. You're, I have said ye are gods, all of ye are children of the Most High, all the angels that God created, even though a third of them turned evil or are evil or whatever, but God made every one of them. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. 
So I, be, I believe something, I don't know, when they come from their dimension to ours, maybe they solidify. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand it. But I believe they can die once they get here. And I also believe, according to Scripture, that they can mate with human women. We have evidence of that all throughout history. That's what I was trying to show you earlier, the idea that the aliens seeded humans on this earth, or the ancient myths, the first emperor of China, he was the son of the dragon and a human woman. The Han people believed that their ancestors were dragons. Okay, maybe that's why God didn't let Paul go there to preach the gospel, because he knew they wouldn't buy it. They, they already worshiped the dragon. Now, that's the Eastern world. The Eastern world already worships the dragon and, and the Nagas, the serpents. So we got to get the Western world to do it. Here's how we're going to do it. Get them to think that they're from another planet. They're here to save mankind. The dragon gives the Antichrist his power, his seat, and great authority. That's the agenda. Everything always goes right back to the Word of God. Remember, National, I've had this sitting here, National Geographic, we are not alone. The setup is coming to transform mankind, give them a born-again experience of corruptible seed. That's the agenda. Okay? I'm not done. I got a lot more to go and a lot more research to do. Hope you've enjoyed this part of it so far. You are the reason why I do what I do. May the Lord bless you. I love you.